We're going to gather around the table of communion and uh, as we do, just grab your cups and Olivia's going to come, I think. Yep. And lead us around the table this morning. Let's focus on what Jesus has won for us on the cross. to get their little puzzles open today. I've got um, I was just going to read one poem but I really feel like I want to read both. They're not too long. Um, <clears throat> they're by a young girl that lives in Queensland and their family, extended family um, were very close to my parents when we were living in, when they lived in New South Wales <clears throat> and they're both yeah they both speak of God's forgiveness to us and sacrifice on the cross the first poem is called people 7.7 billion people 7.7 little kingdoms each beating heart its own story its own family photographs its own fancies each tiny life, always leaving enough space in each unfulfilled corner for someone to come and fill the holes of the places we've been left unloved, ever so needed to be held, by some present hands that do not let go, by forgiveness that would see beyond all of the times we've stuffed up. 7.7 7 billion people, seven times seven mistakes, each counted themselves at one point or another as unworthy of being loved, straying away from their dismay through some kind of pointless distraction, helpless distraction. 7.7 7 billion people and counting, all placed in the heart of God, who became a man, endured the cross to flood our unfulfilled oceans with unmerited grace, undeserved mercy, with incomprehensible love, calling each unto their place of belonging, his arms. So why did Jesus come? Why did God send Jesus to, for that sacrifice? It was because he wanted to cover our sins. So this next poem is called, To My Mistakes. You came as a surprise deed that I did not know I would do, the one my flesh submitted to, ignorant that I would regret you, confused as to why I partook of you, shame, an unwanted gift you gave, and in that shame I was repulsed by myself. Then upon me a great love came, whose arms I did not know how to come to, whose arms, knowing what I did, still came to me, Forgiveness, is this what forgiveness is? You loved all of the shame out of me, like fluid it poured out of me. This love makes no sense. No sense I can make of this. I am just a small, undeserving child in the hands of a kind saviour, Jesus. So, in Romans chapter 5, verse 6 to 9, it says... When we were utterly helpless, Christ came just at the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person. But God showed his great love for us by... I can't read my writing. By sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. So if you'd like to stand, you can take the symbols. And we'll just <clears throat> have a moment, a quiet moment to reflect on those words. And you can take the elements and take them at your own time.
Jesus, there's not much more that we can say or not too much that we can do to show you our gratitude for <clears throat> for find being able to find you. Um, it's incomprehensible to us as humans, this love that you have for us and the world. But we thank you so much for being able to be in a relationship with you. Amen. Excellent. I'm going to ask Peter Rody to come down because uh, I'd like to do a few interviews over the coming weeks with people just to chat to them about their faith and how they came to the Lord. By the way, while you're uh, th- watching Peter come down, I'll just get this microphone sorted out, mate. Um, he looks handsome today. Thank you, my son. Yeah. <laughs> Dave Morgan is here today. Give Dave a nice warm welcome. For those who don't know, Dave and his family were in our church for many years and uh, we had a Thursday night cafe, a Thursday lunchtime cafe out the back there and people would come in from the community and have lunch and we'd also give out bread and a whole lot of stuff to people in need and Dave headed that up and uh, he did a fantastic job over a number of years and then he left. What did you do that for? And uh, went up to uh, Townsville with his family and, um, and Dave actually works with homeless people for St Vincent de Paul now. So Dave always had a heart for that and so it's great to see you here uh, this morning, Dave, and uh, such a joy. You look well, mate. You actually don't look like you've aged, to be honest. You look, seriously, you look the same. <laughs> you look the same. Ah, oh, that's what it is. We all feel like, yeah, right. Okay, cool. Very good. Sorry, Peter, to leave you standing there, mate. Um, Peter, can you remember about what year it was you got saved, approximately? Was that in the 80s? Or? 1994. 90, 1994. Yeah. Right. That's a while ago now, isn't it? Yeah, a bit. Yeah. yeah. And so what, what actually happened at that time that, that, that God touched your heart and you said yes to Jesus? What actually happened to you? Yeah, um, I remember the... When I come home in the Philippines from Saudi Arabia, uh, it's a good timing because on the next day, we have a Bible study in, the, in our place. And I stay in my room because I'm a shy guy. So my wife, uh, she come to my room and then says, coming out and join with us. Her. That's why I come. That's good. You still yeah. love her? Yeah. 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 I still Turn love that her. Turn it up a bit, Chris, if you <laughs> can. <laughs> yeah. So, and the uh, uh, Bible study, I'm very quiet because I observe what they're doing. But before I start the home Bible study, there's a praise and worship. So they singing, clapping, dancing. It's look awkward to me. Because I'm a Catholic. Ah. <laughs> yeah. And I said, it's okay. It looked like uh, they enjoy all of them. And the next day, which is that day, Sunday, um, all my family going to church and all my lo- uh, in laws. Then my wife encouraged me again to, to come. So I come because I love her. <laughs> and then. <laughs> After the message, the pastor uh, invite to the people who want to give their life to Jesus and receive Jesus as Lord and Savior in their lives. So my wife, he, she hold my hands. He put me on the, on the pulpit, on the front. And then, it's okay, no complaint. Say good day. And then the pastor lead me to pray. In the middle of the prayer, when I speak that uh, follow to the pastor that I surrender my life and I open my heart to him, that I accept him, I feel something. It's like, uh, I think the Holy Spirit, but I don't know at the time. The Holy Spirit touched me and I don't know. He lifted me up 
Because I don't feel that I stand on the ground. Wow. Yeah. Then I feel that uh, I'm crying. And I um, have a lot of tears as long as I uh, follow the prayer until we finish our prayer. And then it's different. It changed wow. in my life. <clears throat> wow. And then I feel, when I come home, I feel like empty in my mm. human being. Mm. So, there's a one um, brother, I said, I'm looking something. Mm. Then he said to me, you wanna come with me? We go back to the church on the next day. And uh, we go back to the church, and then the pastor says, you need to uh, deliverance. Ah. So they lead me, deliverance. But before they deliver, they, I signed a form and all my mistake that I'm doing ah. because he want to bring out in my wow. human body. <laughs> so we do that. So since then, it's different. Wow. Wow. That's fantastic. Yeah. So you, you experienced something that was almost physical. Yeah. When you received Jesus into your heart. Yeah. It just, you felt a, a lifting off, a, a lightning. Yeah. And then you went back for prayer. And so they prayed for you. And you, what, what did you feel then when they prayed for you? Same sort of thing. It's uh, more different again because uh, according to the pastor, if you feel something, you just do it. Mm. Just do it. If you vomit, if you go to the toilet, just do it. Right, right. Yeah. Ah, so you really felt a deliverance yeah. from your life. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds us that um, there is a spiritual realm. Yeah. And there's obviously angels, but there are demonic forces that seem to oppress people and get into people's lives somehow. Mm -hmm. And people can be delivered from that yeah. in the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Yeah. So one of the things I've appreciated about Peter over many years now, I've been in the church for oh, a long time now, 18 years or something. Uh, 1994. Yeah, read right about yeah, that. Something yep. like that. Yeah. Uh, is that Peter's a man of faith. You know, when, when, the, when you, I've watched you over the years, when you've been under pressure, you always say, I'm just trusting God. I'm just believing God. And it's amazing how God has blessed your family and you, know, you just see the hand of God upon your life. Praise yeah. the Lord. So what's one thing that you could say is uh, that, that God's really blessed you with uh, in these years? Yeah. Yes, um, I know your wife. You love your wife. Yeah. yeah that's right. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Um, because uh, when you feel the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, you never turn back. You keep going, even in the tough time. And then... Uh, because the Lord says in uh, uh, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in one, one. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I pray no evil because God is with me. Wow. In my family. Beautiful. And he says, uh, me in my house, we will serve uh, the Lord. Joshua, yeah. Yes. As from, and yeah. your family does. Yeah. yeah, beautifully. So uh, thank you very much for sharing this morning. That's thank just touched my heart to hear that. Yeah. Might bring back some memories for people here this morning about when yeah. they came, at the time when they came to Jesus. And uh, if you're watching online and you haven't given your heart to Jesus, um, as Peter shared, um, you know, when you surrender your heart to him and ask him to come into your life as Lord and Saviour, it's not just theoretical. Yeah. You're not just becoming a religious person. In fact, you're not becoming a religious person. You're becoming a new person. Yeah and the power of God comes into your life. So we're going to pray for people right now. And if there's anybody here that wants to renew their faith or um, if you want to give your heart to the Lord for the first time watching online, we're just going to pray a prayer and just pray for you. Let's all just reach out to the Lord, shall we? Father, we just thank you for your presence here today. Pa Peter, can you pray for those people that are watching online and that want to give their heart to Jesus? Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father God. I pray all the people watching this uh, service we have this morning, if you follow in my prayer, Lord Jesus, I come to you, I surrender my life to you, I open my heart to you, I, will, I invite you 
to come in my life. I accept you as Lord and Savior of my life. And Lord, I pray that you make me want to be in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, the Bible tells me, the Word of God says that if you ask Jesus into your heart, you become a new person in Christ. You become born again. You were born naturally and now you're reborn spiritually. And I encourage you, if you're watching, get involved with a local church that exalts Jesus, preaches uh, the Word of God, and that will come around and help you with your faith. If you live in our area, please come and check us out because uh, we've got a great uh, local church family here that will do everything they can to support you uh, in your faith. Praise God. Well, God's good. And thank you very much for sharing today. We really appreciate that. And give Peter a clap as he goes back to his seat. Excellent. Well, grab your Bibles. We're going to come around the word. I don't know whether I'm hot or cold today. That's autumn though, isn't it? And come with me in your Bible, please, to Psalm 16 and verse 11. Psalm 16 and verse 11. simply says, you have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Let me read it again. You have made me no- known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. I just love that verse because... It tells us something about God and our relationship with him, that when we are in in his presence, there is joy and there are pleasures forevermore, eternal pleasures. Today I want to speak about how to enjoy God, how to enjoy God. And maybe just as a little personal assessment as we sit here, Um, Don't speak out loud or anything, but just ask yourself the question, am I enjoying God right now in my life, at this stage of my life? Am I enjoying God? Because I really believe he wants us to enjoy him and to enjoy the relationship that we have in him. Romans 14 verse 17 says, the kingdom of God is not in uh, food and drink, but in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Joy in the Holy Spirit. Amen? So often we think of the Holy Spirit as the one who comes to empower us and it's all very serious, but there's joy that comes with the presence and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 25, where Jesus gives that famous parable of the stewards, and they go out and they use the talents that God has entrusted to them and those who were faithful Jesus says welcome into your father's presence into the joy of the Lord and so when I think of heaven I think of a place of joy peace righteousness and even pleasure that's a good thought isn't it you know when we think about the coming of our saviour It actually uh, says in the Bible that there will be a great marriage supper of the Lamb. Um, Earlier this year, Megan and Chris got married and we had a tremendous uh, celebration, a wonderful service, Christ-centred wedding ceremony. And then we had this wonderful wedding feast and it was absolutely fantastic. Just the joy and the fellowship. It just reminds me of what it's going to be like when we see Jesus on that day, when he returns. I wonder how you think about that day. Is it something that you kind of think about with a little bit of fear and trepidation? Or is it something that you're looking forward to with great joy? Well, I think God wants us to look forward to it with joy. Amen? And uh, you know what? I think, I think when, as we're living in this world now, as Paul says in his letters, 
we, we see as in a glass dimly. Um, you know what it's like when your glasses get fogged up and you can't, those who have glasses, it's not good, is it? You've got to kind of get the hanky out and you've got to clean your glasses and get them back on. Well, even though we have the revelation of Jesus Christ, we actually don't see everything, do we? Uh, we don't see what is to come. And it's that uh, walk of faith to trust God that what lies beyond the grave, so to speak, is far greater and far better than what we are experiencing now. Amen. Amen. And I've just got to let you in on a little secret here. We're all going to be there soon. <laughs> Some of us sooner than others. <laughs> and that's not a bad thing to say that because to be absent from the Lord is... Uh, from, to be absent from the body is to be what? Present. present with the Lord. And so it's a joyous thing to come into the Lord's presence. It's going to be a time of great celebration. There's going to be a party in heaven. In fact, the Bible says, Josh, that whenever one person repents and gives their heart to Jesus, there is rejoicing amongst the angels of heaven. Hallelujah. I think heaven's going to be an awesome place. Not a serious, dour place all serious Christians. Actually, there might be a place for all of the sad Christians, you know, like the, the Christians that look like they've been sucking on lemons for too many years. You know, they've lost the joy of their faith. And there's going to be a place for them. It's going to be a real rehabilitation centre just for them so they can come into the joy of the Lord. But who knows, we all get to that place sometimes where life's just a bit too serious, a bit too, uh, it's hard. And of course, there are seasons of grief and look, that's part of life and struggle. But I reckon that even in the midst of the fire, as, as Megan led us in that song today, there's, we can find joy in the Lord. Amen? Because the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. Hallelujah. And so in heaven, in the new creation, when there's a new heaven and new earth, when Jesus comes back, it's going to be absolutely amazing with no crying or pain or suffering. Amen? But you know what? We can actually have a foretaste of that now. We can enjoy our relationship with God now. And I think God wants us to do that. By the way, when we're thinking about um, eternity, I, I read this uh, amazing uh, quote from Tim Keller. I'm going to find it for you. Tim Keller, by the way, is one of the, uh, the best theologians, writers, thinkers of the last 40, 50 years, particularly the last 30 years, 20 years with his books, an American Presbyterian pastor. And he's had a tremendous influence right across the world. That may not particularly interest you too much um, today, but it, it's a sad day because he's gone home to be with the Lord. Sad for us, good for him. So he's passed away after battling pancreatic cancer. But he had such a tremendous grasp of Scripture and he could communicate difficult and concept truths very simply. And he also had some extraordinary insights, I believe the Holy Spirit gave him. Now listen to this. You got your listening ears right on. This is really good. Christ's miracles were not the suspension of the natural order, but the restoration of the natural order. Yeah. See, when we look at Christ's miracles, we think, well, that's supernatural. That's not the way it should be. No, that is the way it should be. What we experience now with all of our limitations and earthliness is actually not the natural order. That's the distorted order. That's the result of the fall. What we experience now is the fall, the sweat of our brow, the thorns and the struggles that we have. So when Jesus came, he brought heaven with him. <laughs> Amen. I love what he says here. Christ's miracles were not the suspension of the natural order, but the restoration of the natural order. Listen to this. They were a reminder of what once was prior to the fall and a preview of what will eventually be in a universal reality, once again, a world of peace and justice. Wow. I think I might send you that quote through the week. That's an amazing understanding of heaven and earth, Jesus and reality. And so even now in our earthliness, our earthboundness in a sense, we can actually enjoy the presence of God. We can enjoy our relationship with him. And people have recognised that down through the ages. Back in the 1600s, um, the, the Reformed Church at the time, including the Anglican Church, the Church of England as it was then, um, they came up with a way of teaching people called a catechism. Actually, it had been around for a lot longer than that. But they developed a, a, a body of uh, writing called the Westminster Shorter Catechism. 
and it came, a catechism is, is, is a way of teaching with questions, questions and answers. So you ask a question about God and then there's an answer. And so they would teach children this way. So this is the question, this is the answer. Very effective way of teaching. Now, when you come to the beginning of that famous document, and it's still actually used today, um, the very first question of that document is this. What is the chief end of man? The answer, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Wow, I thought that was tremendous insight from the theologians and church leaders of that time and even today. What is the chief end of man? What is our purpose for being created? Well, of course, it's to glorify God, to magnify him. And we know the fall of Adam kind of wrecked that. We rejected God and we started glorifying the creation rather than the creator. We put ourselves on the throne and it really messed things up. But we are here to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And when we think about Adam and Eve and the, the, the fall of humanity, we think of them before the fall and they enjoyed the presence of God. It says that they walked in the cool of the evening with God. Could you imagine that? Walking with God innocently, with peace and joy and all the beauty of that relationship. It was completely untainted by sin. Sweet and pure fellowship with God. But we, we know that the fall actually wrecked that. And ever since, humans have had this ache in their hearts to try and get back into the garden, <laughs> to get back what we lost. And uh, we're longing for it, and yet we're trying to find it in all the wrong places. We try and find it in wealth and power and all sorts of other things. We try and find it in identities and all those kinds of things, when really it is, is, it's something that is actually we can actually get back to. But for many people, it eludes them. We're like lost sheep wandering in the wilderness, alienated, fragmented, broken and hurting, like a child suddenly separated from a loving parent and unable to find that parent. We seem to be void of the light that will lead us home, except for one person. His name is Jesus. When he came, he said, I am the light of the world. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And so while humanity is floundering around, a saviour died on the cross to make it possible for us to be reconciled to the Father and in a sense to come home and to find that which we're longing for in our relationship with him. But let's dig a little deeper here. How do you actually know and enjoy someone you can't see? <laughs> That's difficult, isn't it? You can't touch this transcendent God who the theologians use these fancy words, omnipresent. In other words, he's everywhere, and yet he can be present in one location. He's omniscient. In other words, he's all-knowing. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. And he's infinite. How do you get to know a God like that? He's transcendent. Well, of course, when we see Jesus, we see that he is knowable, that he is perceivable, that he is graspable. And even though we're not with him in person in that physical sense, we can actually know him now. And that is the imminence of God, the God who is with us. When they heralded the coming of the Saviour, they cried out, Emmanuel, God with us. And what an awesome thing that God would come to dwell with us. And through faith and trust in him, we can enjoy our relationship with God once again. Hallelujah. And so here's a few thoughts that will help us, I believe, to enjoy God. Firstly, accept and celebrate who you are in Christ. Turn to the person next to you and say, you are in Christ. You are in Christ. You're a child of God, Jack. Romans chapter 1, I think it's about verse 17, says, To those who received him and believed on his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Amen? We are children of God. Hallelujah. Loved by our Heavenly Father. Now, as you know, I've got four children. They're my children, our children, Joyce and my children. And, you know, nothing can change that. They just are my children. They can say to them, no, you're not, but we can say, yes, here's the birth certificate. They're our children. They even look like me. 
We've got Joy's good looks, though, of course. Um, now, what happens if my children misbehave? Does that make them not my children? No. They're always my children, and I love them, irrespective of where they go and what they do. And we need to understand this about our relationship with God, because if we don't get this, we'll think that our performance is cor- uh, related to how God um, uh, views us as his children. We might think that somehow that can be cut off because of our behaviour or our performance. That is actually not true. Now, what I'm talking about now is our union with God, okay? Okay. Our union with him. Jesus died on the cross. He did it for us. We can do nothing to earn it. He did it for us. This is our union with God and nothing can take it away. Nothing can take it away. Secondly, know that God is present with you and in you by his spirit. And I really enjoyed Peter's testimony this morning about God's presence with him, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Hallelujah. And I think we need to remind ourselves of that constantly, that God is with us and he's not going away. Isn't that good news? Because I am his child. Amen? I am his child. Not my performance. We'll come to that a little bit more in a moment. But because I am his child. And so he comes to be with us in person. You know, when I think of the Holy Spirit, it's not like the force be with you. He's not some, you know, just a power. He's a person, not an impersonal force. And I find that incredibly comforting that God, the Holy Spirit, would come to be with me and walk with me every moment of every day. After, with every passing second and minute, he is with me and never going to leave me. Hallelujah. I think that's pretty good news, right? It's good to have God on your side, right? Do you think he's on your side? Do you think he likes you? He really does. <laughs> you might not like you. Others might not like you. Don't worry about what they say. You've got you to remember that he likes you. He thinks you're okay. If he didn't, he wouldn't, wouldn't have sent his son to die for you. That doesn't mean he approves his bad behaviour. I love my children and uh, when they were little, if they didn't behave well, you know, you have those feelings of, oh, Deb, you know, why are they doing this? And uh, you have those feelings, but they're human feelings. God is not like us, right? He loves us and he's with us and will never leave us nor forsake us. Hallelujah. I, mean, I sometimes think about the, the school bully. Not God. He's <laughs> have, you ever, have you ever been bullied at school? I was. It was terrible. In fact, I, I remember I'll tell you the story. I was, I was a soccer player and uh, on a Saturday on the field, we were playing against his team. He was in the team and I deliberately tripped him over. I was a little boy at the time. Go easy on me. And who knows that's not a good thing to do to the school bully. It's like one of those aha moments when I'd done it. I thought, oh my goodness, what have I done? Anyway... That was on Saturday. I lived in dread until Monday morning. Monday morning, he sent his little minions after me. They always have these little guys who follow them around. Have you noticed that? They're the, there's a supposed hit men, but they're not really. And they said, Wayne, I don't remember his name, Wayne. Wayne. And uh, so I went down and he, they said, you, Wayne wants to see you on the Oval. And I thought, well, I can't chicken out of this. Uh, I, I've got to show up. You know what it's like? Boys don't chicken out. So I showed up and he had some words with me. And before I knew it, he, he hit me in the stomach and the bread basket, and you know what that's like, it just sends you to the ground. And that was it. Yeah, I didn't trip him over the next week. <laughs> but what if I had God with me? You know, it's like those movie scenes where the little boy's been picked on and then his dad, you know, uh, what's The Rock's name? What's his, Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, <laughs> he's his dad, and he rocks up with all his muscles and all the kids run away because of dad. You know, the little boy's there with dad backing him up. Well, that's the way we've got to view our lives. The devil's no match for Jesus. And I'm in Christ and Christ is in me. Hallelujah. Whatever can come against me, God is for me. Amen. Hallelujah. He's with me and he's my big, Jesus is my big brother. <laughs> Amen. So we've got to get that into our spirit that he is with us. 
Thirdly, learn to enjoy fellowship with God through conversation. Conversation, of course, that's prayer, spending time with him throughout the day, talking with him, but then having solitude, silence with God, just getting alone with him, learning to fellowship with God through conversation. And here's a unique thing that maybe some haven't thought of. When you're in the fellowship of the saints, God can also speak to you through the saints, right? I get so much revelation and blessing and the presence of God when I'm with other Christians. And the fellowship of the church is so critical for a person's spiritual well-being, let alone other factors in their lives. And, of course, we need to bring the Bible into that equation because when you're reading the Word, it should never really become a chore for us because we know that we're fellowshipping with God in the pages of this book. If we see it like that and if we're prayerful about it, God will speak to us and we will commune with him in the pages of this book. You know, you can't have decent fellowship with somebody without a conversation. That's difficult, isn't it? If Roger and I went out on our bike rides together and never spoke to each other, I would think, well, what's wrong? Have I done something wrong? <laughs> so it's just, we, we make prayer into this religious thing and it's a chore. We read Bible reading. Oh, okay, I've got to read the Bible. No, come on, this is fellowship with Almighty God. It's Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit um, with you. And uh, I, I just tell you, the more I go on, and of course the flesh doesn't want to do that. The flesh wants to sleep in. It doesn't want to get up early and have a devotional or at any time of the day. The flesh just wants to watch TV and Netflix and spend hours of watching this thing, which I probably do a bit too much of. Um, but when we say, okay, well, this, the flesh, I need to put my flesh in, in, in its place and start to do what is spiritual and relational before God and, and, and just spend time with him, it's amazing what you step into. You know, those comments that Peter made about the presence of the living God are very real in the pages of this book when you fellowship with him. Very real when you spend time in prayer, quiet time in prayer. Who knows that life is too rushed and too busy, right? We're too busy rushing to the next thing, too busy rushing here and not really staying present in the present. I've actually written down here that uh, uh, if we stay present in the present, you'll enjoy more of his presence. It's a bit tricky, I know. But we've got to have that moment, that stillness, that time with God where we're just, everything else is off the plate and it's just me and God, just still with him. We might be out in a walk. It might be sitting in your lounge room. might be on the front porch, in bed, wherever. Just you and God, just quiet, praying, having time with him. Friendship is developed through time together, right? So I just want to encourage you with that afresh because I know what it's like. Even as a pastor, Jack, you get so busy, it's easy not to have that quality time with God. You rush through your devotional, rush through your prayer time and then wonder why you're still anxious two hours later, which if I just took that time just to spend with him, I'd have greater peace because the Prince of Peace has got his rightful place in my life. Hallelujah. So there's three things and look, there's, there's nothing, not rocket science, just the basics really, but we need to keep coming back to those foundational things where we realise that he's with us, that we're a child of God, he's never going to leave us nor forsake us and that I can actually enjoy his presence. He wants us to enjoy him. Jesus said to his disciples, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. What an amazing thing. I love that, that, that song that we sing, Deb, I'm a friend of God. It's one of my favourite all-time songs. I am a friend of God, I am a friend of God, I am a friend of God. He calls me friend and he's our friend. He wants to be a friend to us. Yes, Almighty God. Yes, King of kings and Lord of lords. Yes, the one we bow down to and worship, but also a friend. Hallelujah. He's a monarch who wants to be our friend. How good is that? Hallelujah. So I just want to sow those thoughts into your thinking this week, and uh, hopefully you can have a think this week about how you can enjoy your relationship with God. Here's a few other little things as we close. Stop striving to get God to accept you. He already does in Christ. Amen? This is not based on your performance, but it is your birthright as a child of God. Yeah? Uh, there's lots of things I could read here. Don't make your work or ministry your relationship with God. That's a big thing for me as a pastor because it's so closely and intimately tied. Uh, I am not my work. I have a relationship with God, Roger Fitton, apart from my ministry. 
If my ministry is not there, I still have a relationship with God. That means I still have life in him. Amen? Amen. Now, I'm not saying that is important, your work. Uh, it's not important, your ministry and your work. Very important. But it's not my relationship with God. Jesus' relationship with the Father is not based on his work, but on his sonship. Jesus came and did a great work. That's not the basis of his relationship with God. How are you finding this? You okay with all this this morning? Yeah. yeah. Um, Jesus served the Father not because God is a taskmaster, but because Jesus loves the Father and vice versa. Just read the Gospel of John, you kind of get that. Jesus wants us to enter into the love of the Father just like he has. It's the outflow of love and not the basis of it. In other words, his work. So this means for me, if I succeed or seem to fail, it does not change a bit my standing before God. And so I aim to enjoy God apart from my work, my ministry, and my doings. You know, you're a human being, not a human doing. Doing is important. It's the outflow, but we're human beings first. I'm a child of God first and foremost. Here's something else. You ready, you ready for this? Uh, understand that sin hinders fellowship and communion with God, but it does not change your standing or your union with him. Repent of your sin and run to the Father. Don't run away from him because he hasn't moved. The more you appreciate God's love for you in Christ, the less you'll want to sin. You'll want to love him back. Praise God. Enjoying God also comes through thankfulness to him, appreciating him for who he is. So if we only see our relationship with God in, in transactional terms, in other words, there's a transaction happening. If I pray God will do something, uh, that's not the basis of our relationship. That's one of the fruit of it. But we see our relationship based on our communion with him and what Jesus has won for us on the cross. So thankfulness, and I think thankfulness helps us to appreciate who he is and helps us to love him back. And this is one of the beautiful things that I think is so wonderful about being reunited with the Father through Jesus is that we can love God back. Don't make it a one-way thing. And God's just my, you know, he's just going to meet my needs, do everything I want, make me comfortable, help me through. No, what about loving him back? Loving him. Express that love to him in word and deed to him and by honouring him through obedience. And here's one final little thought. Practice being still at any given moment and thank God for his presence right now. Be still. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that our relationship with you is not some dry religious thing. It's not a burden. It's not, you're not a taskmaster just wanting us to do stuff for you. Lord, you're a loving Heavenly Father and you showed us the extent of your love by sending your Son and Jesus himself willingly went to the cross to show God's love towards us. And Father, we just thank you that this week, as we go out into this week, we don't have to be striving and stressing about our relationship with you. We don't have to be striving and stressing about life because you're with us and we're your children. We're heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. All the blessings of Christ are ours. And Father, we can go into this week knowing that we can walk with you in a relaxed way and enjoy your presence and enjoy your company. Father, help us to, uh, to enjoy our time in the Word and in prayer that it wouldn't be a chore but just a blessing. And Lord, I just thank you for helping each one of us to learn more and more what it is to, to enjoy you because we know the writers of that catechism were right that the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. So, Father, we enter into the joy of the Lord right now in Jesus' name. We enter into that and we receive it by faith. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Praise God. Well, go out and enjoy God this week. He wants to enjoy you too. Amen. Let's stand to our feet, shall we? And we're going to ask Megan to come back and lead us in a song, maybe the first one, Megs.
of you. 